Hey everyone, um, this is Ian from Collector Emitter, and I know this is a bit of a different type of video, uh, but I wanted to share with you this episode of the Patreon podcast that I do. So uh, I'm not sure if everyone is aware, but I do have a Patreon uh, where the support kind of helps keep the channel going and helps fund doing different types of videos and um, getting different types of pedals to you know try out all this stuff. And and so the biggest thing that I give back for the support on there is this podcast. Now, I wanted to kind of expand who I can share this podcast with. And I also wanted to start bringing in guests. And so the way I kind of decided to put it all together is I will share the episodes on YouTube when there is a guest. And when there's not a guest, uh, I won't necessarily have a guest each month, each episode. So when there's not a guest, then um, the podcast will only be on the RSS feed through Patreon. And if you want to listen to this in your podcast app, um, you'll have to go support on Patreon. Uh, for now, that's only because podcast hosting is kind of expensive and uh, Patreon, I can do it for free through them. So um, this is kind of the setup for now. Um, but what I'll do is every time there's a guest, the video uh, version of the podcast will be on here. Uh, and it's just the audio. I'm not going to um, you know, record uh, the conversation in video. These are just um, you know, audio calls. And so you'll get the audio version on here that is fully free and you'll get it delayed by two weeks. And uh, why I'm delaying it by two weeks is because uh, today on the Patreon, a bonus episode is gonna go live. And so you'll be able to see this on YouTube. And if you like it, you wanna hear more, um, this episode is with John from Rare Buzz Effects. And we talked about our uh, five Desert Island albums. And then I gave a shout out for a movie that I highly recommend. Um, so that's kind of what the bonus is. We don't talk about gear. We talk about other things that we enjoy. Uh, other, you know, music, movies, TV, podcasts, anything. Um, so if you're interested in hearing that, go over to the Patreon and support. You also get audio downloads, the podcast in an RSS feed form. Um, and if you don't want to support, that's totally okay. Just watching the videos is support. And, you know, I do get a bit of uh, YouTube ad revenue for you doing that. And really just seeing the views and the comments is, you know, amazing to me. So no pressure ever to go onto the Patreon and support. I'm trying to keep it so that there's a nice bonus for supporting, but it's not enough that I'm walling off, you know, a good chunk of what I make because I want to share that with everybody. So with that all being said, in the future, any guest episodes like this will be on the YouTube channel as well. And any episode that's just me talking is going to be only on the Patreon. So keep an eye out for those. If you're interested, you know, go join the Patreon. Leave some comments if you have any suggestions for topics or anything like that. Uh, join my Discord server if you want to talk about this kind of stuff. Um, and also talk about other kinds of things. We talk a lot about photography and video games and all kinds of stuff. Um, it's fun over there. So yeah, that's everything I'm going to say. And here is a conversation between me and John from Rare Buzz Effects talking about affordable boutique pedals. Hey everyone, this is the October episode of the Collector Emitter Patreon podcast. Uh, no real news or uh, changes or anything since uh, last month's episode, so we're just going to jump into it. And exciting to jump into it because this is the first episode of the podcast where uh, I'm bringing a guest in. So I have uh, here John from Rare Buzz Effects. And uh, he's going to kind of help with the discussion. So instead of just getting my thoughts on, uh, you know, the topic for the episode, um, we're going to talk about something that 
John knows about and, uh, you know, kind of get his insight on pedal builder's perspective of this type of thing. So for the episode, we're going to talk about affordable boutique pedals and kind of, um, you know, all the aspects of that. Uh, and so, yeah, here is John. Well, hello. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thank you for making the time to be on the podcast and for, Happy to do. especially for being the first guest. Well, thank you. It's, it is an honor. Well, uh, I, we've known each other online for a while, but never, uh, even when I was on the guitar knobs, it was a week where you weren't there. Um, you weren't, you know, subbing in. And so, um, beyond, uh, discord, I don't know if we've ever had, you know, an, an actual voice to voice conversation. So this is great. I don't think we have. Yeah. This is, this is, uh, we're, we're through the looking glass here, folks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what's great about this uh, the the pedal community. There's a uh, you know so many of us doing cool things and and we're all friendly. <laughs> we all uh, you know want to talk to yeah. each other and have fun. So yeah, so let's uh, let's just dive into um, the topic here. I've got some notes and can kind of you know. Uh, and some questions for you and can kind of guide what we talk about. But, you know, like I said, we're going to talk about affordable boutique pedals. And I thought you were a great, uh, you know, expert for this because um, of your new 1970s series and kind of how you're, uh, you know, th with these and with, you know, some of your previous pedals focusing on, you know, kind of keeping things accessible um, and absolutely in, in that lower price point. So. Um, so yeah, uh, I guess my first note was just kind of talking about why boutique pedals are, are typically more expensive, you know, kind of setting the stage for <laughs> the affordability. So, um, you know, I'm sure you have your insight on this, um, you know, just from my perspective, I know a lot of it's, you know, not only the price of parts and the time going into it but you know the kind of the value of the the design and you know the R&D and all that which kind of brings prices up absolutely and and I think you've kind of hit on a lot of the things right there is a, a smaller builder in many cases you're talking about either one person or uh, a very small group of people and and you know really I would say that describes the the great majority of the folks you would see out there in the boutique world. You know, even places right. like Earthquaker and JHS. I mean, when you compare those, I mean, in in the world of boutique pedals, they're giants, right? Right. Having you know tens of employees, but in in the world of business and manufacturing, they're still quite small. So, development cost in terms of you know individual time investment is huge um and then you start running into things uh just in terms of the physical cost of the pedal itself um like economies of scale if you've got a boss or an ibanez where they're going to make a million of something um obviously they can get a much better price on every single one of those components whereas a smaller builder who might be making as few as one of something um they're going to have to pay a little bit more and, and, you know, those prices are, are then passed on to the consumers. So I think those two things are kind of the, the driving force of the price there, just the, the individual investment, you know, it's when, when you put your blood, sweat and tears into a pedal uh, that you're going to sell for, you know, whatever the price may be, if you're only going to make four or $5, that just doesn't make sense. You know, unless you're going to sell hundreds and hundreds of them, which in, in that case, you know, it, <laughs> after, after my experience with the, uh, the cyborg, it almost makes less sense <laughs> because it's just, it's so, it's so much of your time goes into building those pedals and, and getting them out and getting them shipped. And, you know, all of the little things that a business has to do that you don't necessarily see, um, just right. kind of contributes to that cost. So, yeah, I guess that's something you see with, you know, much bigger industries, um, you know, much bigger than even the entire uh, gear industry, but, you know, like selling, um, you know, a computer for, 
you know, less of a profit or no profit so that you can make more money or maybe an, a phone or something like that would be a better example of making more money in, you know, having people owning that. But there's not, you know, a, a real um, case where anybody would be eventually making money later by just having, uh, you know, a million um, people owning their pedal. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, with all that info, it's kind of amazing to me that some boutique builders, especially, uh, you know, like you said, there's the boutique uh, brands that have tens of employees like uh, JHS, and they have a, an affordable line. But it's even more amazing to me that, you know, someone like yourself, or there's a few others um, just making by themselves, or maybe uh, one other person helping making pedals that hit that, you know, very low price point of, you know, kind of being accessible to anybody. Exactly. And uh, I think, you know, I'll, I'll speak to my own personal experience with the 1970 line is when, when I envisioned this line, I kind of started from the ground up with a price point in mind. And when you know, I, I guess there's kind of two ways to design one is I want it to be this price and you maybe have to make concessions to get it there. And the other is I want it to be exactly what I want. And then it just, it costs what it costs. Right. Um, and I think that's, you know, my product line, I try to do a nice balance of that. You know, the 1970 line is, uh, you know, the, the other gentleman that works with me, Brandon, we say to each other is that's, what's going to pay the rent and keep the lights on. And then we can kind of go crazy with the other stuff. And if we don't sell, hundreds of them, it's okay because we've also got this more affordable line that is a little bit more accessible to your average guitarist or even somebody that's just starting out. Um, right. To, to kind of be the bread and butter, right? Yeah. And um, yeah, I, I know you're kind of offering, I'd love to hear, uh, you know, um, your perspective on, you know, each model or, you know, kind of why, you um, picked the types of circuits for the series that you did, but you know you are kind of offering the. Uh, I remember when I was buying my first pedals. Beyond just, you know, I had a um, a tube screamer and a distortion, which is a Digitech hot head, which is kind of bad no matter how you set the knobs. Uh, I don't know why I <laughs> bought that. Besides it looking cool with flames on it, but I was, you know. 12 or whatever but uh when i set out to you know lay a few years later put together an actual pedal board it's like okay well let me get one of each and you kind of covered that spectrum of these are the basics if you're really interested in you know starting to explore these sounds or even if you just want to put one of each as your pedal board and that'll cover you for any gig that you might need basically yeah, and that's that's really uh, a big part of the the path that we went down when we cho when we chose the types of effects. Um, I will say some of some of the design and some of the line was dictated by existing pedals. There are there are a couple in in the uh, nineteen seventy series that um, I'll be pretty transparent are just rebadged other pedals. Right. So you know the snitch and then the the cyborg, which was the Ukrainian themed snitch. Mm -hmm. uh, has been a very successful pedal for us and we wanted to keep that in production and and introduce it uh, into that line so the 1970 distortion is i mean almost a part for part exact uh circuit copy of what those two uh previous pedals were so although they're not in production anymore you can certainly find that same sound um right the preamp is what I would say is the culmination of our bluefish and tone station circuits, all discrete, uh, kind of overdrive, very low gain. In fact, um, unless you've got pretty hot pickups, it won't break up on its own. I mean, it's it's designed to basically be a bass tone, but then if you feed more signal into it, you know, you put dirt in front of it, it'll it'll really really uh, augment whatever you've got going on. Um, and then the octave is. Uh, based on the same green ringer circuit that our Apple octave uh, do-it-yourself kit 
uh, is based on. So those three of the six are pretty much kind of uh, pre-existing pedals that we've maybe made some tweaks to and, and got to what I would consider to be their final form. Um, and then the other three were ones that we chose uh, to kind of fill the voids there. Um, you know, there's those three kind of all fill the, the dirt category. We definitely wanted modulation, which is where the vibe came in. Um, the filter, so the the filter is the, the blue pedal. Um, I guess we really haven't talked about visually. They're all, you know, each one is a different color. If you put all six of them next to each other, it's a rainbow. And they've got each one has a different uh, uh, 1970s disco dancer as the kind of the primary art on them. Right. Um, and the blue pedal was originally supposed to be a, uh, a range master style boost. And uh, the first prototype of that, we, we, kind of ran it through its paces and we looked at each other and it's like there is so much wrong with this <laughs> you know we're we're gonna have to just kind of start from scratch on it anyway so um you know made the decision to go with uh the envelope filter um just to get something that's a little bit different there aren't a whole lot of uh filter style effects out there um particularly in this price point so right. i think it, it offers uh you know, a little diversity. If there's a bass player out there, we've done we've beat on it with our studio bass, and it it holds up pretty well, uh, even in the lower register. So, um, that's a fun one. And then the sixth one, which is the one that we haven't quite ironed out yet, I think we're close, uh, desperately close, is the fuzz. Um, you know, I I'll, I will go off on a little tangent here, Ian. Fuzz is deceptively <laughs> difficult. Yes, that's exactly what I was going to say when you said, you know, you're you're close, but you're not quite done. Of course, it's the fuzz because you right. know, that's where that the nuance matters most. It does, and uh, I mean, I know you and uh, Alec had uh, more than one revision on the park garden. <laughs> oh, we'll, we'll leave it at yeah. that. <laughs> it was it's it's quite a process, and it's. You know, fuzz is one of those things where you can make a fuzz with almost no components and it'll sound okay, but it's just that last 10% of getting it from okay to, oh yeah, that's, that's good. Right. Um, that, that's really where the, where the devil's in the details. And, uh, so this one, it's, uh, pretty transparently based on, um, an old maestro circuit. Uh, we have gone through it and made some changes to make it a little bit more adaptive to the, uh, you know, modern parts availability and, uh, to make the production a little faster. Um, but the one issue we've run into, which is the same issue that the original pedal has is it is pretty high pitched and shrill. And that's into like a Marshall or a Vox amp, which right. are pretty, deeply voiced anyway and i just think you know you we run that into a fender and it's going to be like ice picks so um that's kind of the last little bit that we're trying to iron out is to get that that particular setting get the voicing down to where it's a little bit more tasteful um, right. in the mix right. so but it, you know like we said it's just so difficult to dial in and, and it shouldn't be. It should be easy, right? It's you know, all you're doing is destroying the signal, right? <laughs> right. You'd think that the one that's the most destructive, you hear, like, you worry the most or the least about, you know, how much the clarity and, you know, how, comes through and how transparent it is and all that. But, yeah, it, it really does. I think, uh, you know, exactly like what you said about the that frequency response across a few different amps it's um i think that was the toughest thing with park garden because when we're i have a very very bright uh marshall based amp um that's going into um a weber blue alnico speaker which is itself very bright and so when i would play it i'd say oh we really need to turn down the you know brightness on this and then Alec would play it on his dark amp and say, now it sounds bad. Uh, and so we'd have to find the medium where it works for every amp because, um, one, you want everybody to be able to enjoy it. But two, with fuzz, you often have less controls. It's mostly, you know, gain and volume or, right. you know, um, like once you get into, you know, a really expansive EQ, it kind of starts to break away the spirit and you know even like the the sound or like it just doesn't feel right 
of the fuzz. And I, I'd absolutely agree with that. I think, you know, my, my fuzz bomb pedal, I'm, I'm extremely happy with how that turned out, essentially only having, I mean, it's got volume and then the timbre control, which gives you a little bit of voice and control, but I mean, it's, you turn it on and it's, this is it, you know, this is what you get. Right. Um, and, and we've been very, very happy with how that has translated across different amps and different playing surfaces. Uh, you know, the one thing I would say too, um, is one thing I've had to kind of come to terms with as a builder is that there is not a pedal that will sound great on every single rig. And there's been times where I would rather buy a pedal back from a customer and just say, Hey, you know, this one's not for you and it's not, it's nothing that I did wrong and it's nothing that you're doing wrong. You know, we'll go through the usual, like, let's do some, uh, let's do some quality control testing and make sure that we just don't have it maybe in the wrong part of the signal chain, or maybe, you know, there's some expectation about what it should do. That's not quite there, but you know, if it's, if it's a pedal, that's just not going to work for what that customer's looking for, or that player's looking for, then, uh, you know, needs to come back home. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the best pedal for somebody might be the worst pedal for somebody else. And I, I try to be pretty, uh, pretty conscious of that. Absolutely. Yeah, that's... And I think, a, I think a lot of the smaller builders are the same way. You know, we, we're we here, you know, let me let me be crystal clear. There is no money in this. There's zero dollars. <laughs> right. In fact, negative money is probably... <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, we're, we're not out here getting rich. Um, you know, I know my main motivation. I just don't have the time left in my life to become a virtuoso guitar player. So this is kind of how I contribute to the music scene at large is if there's somebody that's a much better guitarist than I am, that's able to, you know, plug in something that I built and it inspires them to write a riff that becomes a song. Then that's what that's, that's where my purpose is. So that is, um, it's so interesting that you say that. And it almost makes me wish that, uh, you know, we, uh, I knew that before, uh, recording because that could have been our whole, you know, basis of what we're talking about. Because that's exactly for me. It's uh, you know, it's like I felt I had kind of hit the limit of my you know improving my playing, and I when I started making the videos, I a uh, band that I was in had broken up, and I resigned that I just can't write a song on my own. It's not what I'm good at. <laughs> I can play in a band and I love doing it, but I can't write the song. <laughs> and so uh, it was like, well, what can I do to be involved? And, you know, uh, there's so many ways to to be involved that, you know, even don't necessarily even, in, uh, you know, include having some kind of technical knowledge or, you know, musical ability. It, you know, there's ways right. outside of that even. But uh, it's great to have some way to stay connected to, um, you know, the community and what's going on and, you know, kind of contribute in your own way instead of forcing yourself to contribute in, you know, kind of the, the normal way or, or not that to be, um, you know, reductive of being an amazing musician, cause that's absolutely needed. Uh, we want to hear good music, but, you know, to contribute in a way that's different than, you know, kind of the, the first assumption or the first uh, thing that most people go for. Exactly. And I just think there's so many pieces that go into what then becomes a song and, and inspires somebody else down the road that if I can just be a small part of that, you know, if, if something I build ends up on a pedal board and inspires somebody, or if there's a demo that you do that somebody says, Hey, I want that pedal. And then that pedal leads to the song. I mean, it's, there's, right. there's pieces that build up to, uh, what happens and it's not done in a vacuum. So absolutely. I'm, I'm glad to hear that you kind of feel the same way because <laughs> it's nice to get a little, uh, uh, a little confirmation from, a from another person in the industry that I'm not a complete screw up for, you know, kind of, kind of saying, you know, I, I just, this is going to be the limit of what I'm able to do. So. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I feel the same way and that's something I think about a lot now because you know, I'd say um, maybe 90% of the time that I play music is now solely 
for demos, not because I don't enjoy playing music anymore or, uh, you know, because, um, you know, of any real significant reason, but it's just like, well, I'm in a groove with this and this is always, there's always a good result at the end. And I always feel satisfied with my creativity and like how I used my energy. But when I, you know, sit at my computer and with a blank slate, try to write a song or, you know, come up with something or, um, you know, improve my playing in some way. That's, it's like rolling the dice to see, you know, how that, how I'm going to feel in an hour because of how, you know, productive or not I was. And so it's nice to, you know, unshackle from, you know, having to do that and just say, well, this is what I enjoy. And maybe it's not, you know, like, creating the song and you know making the thing that you'd think would be the most fulfilling but it's it's doing something that's fulfilling and still contributing absolutely absolutely so yeah back to uh i love uh the tangent um uh but i'm gonna bring us back to the uh 1970 series Um, yeah please do just to kind of um, you know, talk about, um, most of these pedals are, um, around the $110 price. Is that correct? That's correct. The, so six, I'm sorry, five of the six pedals are at the one Oh nine ninety nine price right. point. The only one that's more is the vibe. And, uh, I will be fully transparent. There is a part in that vibe that is almost $8. Yeah. Um, which and I mean, there's just no way around clarify, it. So. An eight dollar part might be like, oh, it's eight dollars. But when you're talking, you know, the end price of one hundred and ten dollars, eight dollars is huge. And it also, uh, you know, for the nerds in the audience, so that vibe does use a four layer board instead of a two layer board that the other uh, pedals in the series do. So, I mean, it's I, I spent ten years in automotive and. When expensive cars break, it's because they're, you know, it costs more to fix because they're made out of expensive parts, right? So, yeah, you know, the, the the vibe is you know, $25 more because it's just got $25 more worth of stuff in it. Um, uh, but, uh, but uh, you know, we tried to keep that whole series in a very affordable price point. I mean, I know there's other... Uh, there are other makers that have, a, have similar series uh, out now. Um, you know, the Fender and JHS and, uh, you know, pretty much the entire Earthquaker line is is price pointed there unless you get into the crazy stuff. And we wanted to be very conscious of that and uh, still give folks, uh, you know, a foothold into a, a, a brand that might not be as familiar to other folks uh, and still have a, a, a good pedal. So Right. And that's exactly, uh, you know, ties into kind of my, uh, you know, culmination of all this is kind of, you know, the choice of buying a boutique pedal or, you know, buying boutique anything or, you know, small build or anything versus something mass produced. Um, and you know, there's a lot of, often I'll get a comment on a demo. It's like, Oh, well there's this similar pedal that, uh, I can get for $50 or whatever. And it's like, well, if that, satisfies your need and that's where you want to put your money that's absolutely fine you know that i think i have had the conversation with a commenter about well it's kind of um exclusive to make you know pedals are expensive and so having you know talking about everybody should buy boutique pedals and this it's it's you know kind of leaving out the people who can't afford it and it's like well it's a hobby And so, you know, there's a mass produced anything that'll do the job, but, you know, at least personally, when I get into a hobby, if that's the thing that I'm going to enjoy very surface level, I might not invest deeper, but if it's something that I want to, you know, participate in, then I would love to support the other people in the community, even if that's, you know, a slight price increase, uh, and, um, something that comes with that price increase is, you know, an attention to detail, even just in the, the way that somebody is touching every step of the process 
to make sure that it works before it comes to you and make sure that it's just right. Um, and so that's where, you know, kind of even a, a $110 affordable pedal can be, you know, expensive compared to, or, you know, different compared to some, you know, I'm sure, I don't know off the top of my head, the prices of the Fender line, but I'm sure they have something hovering a little bit lower than there. And then, you know, you have like EHX and things like that, but you know, there's something special to, you know, an exchange with another person who's equally as passionate about the thing that you're interested in. Exactly. And, and one thing that I've, you know, I've said it on the guitar knobs before, but I always encourage folks, you know, again, I'm not a stellar guitarist, but just from my own experience, I encourage folks to, uh, if, if you're interested in a particular effect and you don't feel comfortable spending, you know, 150, 250, 350 dollars on something that would come from a smaller boutique company, um, go get the boss, you know, go get the Amazon special. You, you might plug in, you know, let's, let's pick a, uh, an effect out of the air here. You might plug in, um, flange and hate it. And yeah, I mean, at least you're out, you know, 25, 40, 50, 60 bucks. But if you plug in flange and you love it, well, that boss pedal or that Amazon special, that might do 80% of what you want it to do. And that boutique pedal might do 150% because it does 50% of something that you didn't even know existed. Right. Um, so it's, you know, I, it, you don't go out and buy a Ferrari to learn how to drive. <laughs> you know, you figure out what, what you want to do and then, okay, well, I like this, so I'm going to go down that road. Um, I think folks that get into gear, you know, they don't buy three pedals and that's it. You know, you're, <laughs> you're kind of constantly right. uh, buying, selling, trading, uh, you know, whatever it takes to, to find that next thing that, that inspires you or, you know, encourages a certain type of playing. Um, yeah, I, w I would just, you know, again, encourage folks to, to try different things. And, you know, if it's, if you start with an affordable pedal and end up with something that's a little pricier or end up with, you know, uh, something that's down a different path. I mean, you know, we talked a little bit about pricing and, you know, in some cases pricing is just the sum of the parts and the labor, but in other cases, you know, we, we you and I are both familiar with builders that what they do on the inside of that enclosure is nothing short of art. Right. You know, Absolutely. These, these point to point builders where, I mean, just the, the, the level of skill that it takes to end up with, a layout that looks like that and and the 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 clarity of the sound that it shouldn't i mean it should sound terrible i mean electronically it should sound like <laughs> garbage because there's nothing in there to hold the parts together there's nothing in there. i mean it's you know all of the electronic interference that is is happening in there i'm sure but they sound fantastic and they look fantastic and i mean that that type of artistry it just costs money and that, i mean i think I think most buyers understand that. And that's why those types of builders tend to run six, eight, 10, 12 month wait lists because the people that want that are willing to wait and willing to pay. So absolutely. Yeah. I, I like the way you described it. I always say, you know, buying, um, you know, maybe something, uh, point to point or the, you know, super, uh, over the top boutique version of something is going to give you that maybe extra 10% and not everybody's going to notice it. Not everybody, not every audience member will notice it. Not every player will notice or feel it or care about it. But if you do, it gives you that. But I like how you described it where it's, it's almost, you know, the, you hit the hundred percent with, you know, whatever pedal you might buy or, you know, if you get the Amazon special, you might get the, you know, 70%, but you're getting most of it. But, you know, when you go, um, you know, boutique in any way, the, the care that's, you know, kind of going into these, you're getting that extra boost. And then when you go, you know, over the top, uh, you know, point to point, 
or you know some of these incredibly involved digital pedals or things like that you're getting uh you know 150 or you know somewhere the above and beyond percentage um i like how you described that so and and i think you made a good point too that to some people that 80 percent might be enough and, and i'll give you a perfect example the chorus pedal that i use on my board at home is one of those uh Camis analog choruses that Ryan at 60 cycle hum put on as a, you know, the, the affordable board. And for me, all I want out of chorus is for Shanti's tone at the end of under the bridge. Like that's the sound. Right. And that pedal does the sound. I don't need any more than that. I don't need any less than that. And I mean, there may be a time down the road where I invest in a better one that inspires me to play a different way. But for now, that's what I want. That's what I need. And that's what I've got. Um, now, I am extremely picky about overdrive and distortion as my entire product line for the almost five-year history of this company <laughs> would indicate, because that's been the bulk of what I've built, because yeah. that's just that that's the sound where I am discriminating, and I can say, hey, I you know, I like it, but, you know, just this one frequency doesn't sound quite right. Is there anything we can do to open that up? And that's... And everybody's different when it comes to what they hear and what they want. So, absolutely, um, I I think also if the the eighty uh, percent doesn't do it for you, uh, but there is something that you you like, uh, you know, you can recognize that you like it, but it it's uh, I don't. It's hard to describe what I mean, but not to be turned off of. Oh, I think I might like chorus, but this unit version only does the Frusciante chorus and I don't like that or you know not me speaking that's the hypothetical to use my actual sure. experience uh, when I first was getting deeper into pedals I thought I hated fuzz <laughs> and look at me now <laughs> but that's because the only fuzz pedal I had was um, or I had tried was a uh, Big Muff and like the current um, or current at the time, this was 2010. Um, but the, uh, you know, current, uh, small box big muff. And I tried one and I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to make a controversial statement here. Yes, please do. I would say the big muff is not a fuzz. And I think that's where a lot of people start if if they go into the Big Muff thinking this is fuzz and I hate it, I think that's where a lot of the love ends for fuzz. Right. Because I I feel that uh, and and we'll turn off commenting on this post, <laughs> but I feel that you know the Big Muff is really a high gain distortion. Yeah, absolutely. At best, and, and I mean I know we're kind of like splitting hairs here because high gain distortion, low gain fuzz, they kind of share the same the same space, but. Um, I think there's a distinct difference between the way that, and we'll, I'll use what I would consider to be the proverbial fuzz, the fuzz face, the way that that pedal reacts to pick dynamics, the volume control on the guitar, what it actually sounds like coming out the other end is entirely different than all of those same things on the, on the big muff, which is again, responds and acts much more like a distortion than a fuzz. Yeah, I would agree. I would almost and uh uh i will say you're in um at least on the patreon version when this goes up on youtube who knows what will happen but uh <laughs> you're you're at least in good company if people know uh you know how much awful things i say about big muffs uh which i have recently come around on slightly but i would take it further and say a big muff is kind of its own thing it certainly you know falls somewhere between distortion and fuzz uh and even which version or the tolerance of the parts and how they've kind of shifted into different values um you know that can kind of change some of that too but to me the big muff the most important feature of it is the tone stack which makes it sound like a big muff and if you put right. that tone stack on anything else it's a big muff and the interesting thing is if you take the tone stack away, it's no longer a big muff. And so I think it's, it's really its own, uh, you know, kind of micro 
genre of pedal. And, you know, you have to want a Big Muff to enjoy the Big Muff. And I think there's enough clones of it and inspired by pedals at this point that I think you're right. It really kind of creates its own genre. Because if you hear it in a song, I mean, it's the, you're not confused about what it is. Right. I mean, that's like, yeah, that, that is a Big Muff. So... Um, I will give, hey, I'll tell you what, Patreon listeners, I'm going to make this worth your money here because you're going to hear about something that is like top secret. <laughs> so feel free to spread it on Reddit. But um, one of our upcoming pedals, I have never done a Big Muff because I'm one part of my, uh, we're going to go all over the place here. Part of my design <laughs> philosophy is if I can't improve on something that already exists, I'm not interested in releasing a pedal just to have more stuff in my product line. Um, so I have kind of steered clear of Big Muff because there's not much in that arena that I've felt that I can do. However, there is a certain band called Deep Valley, and both words are spelled wrong. <laughs> and <laughs> if, if you're not familiar, um, the lead singer and guitarist, Lindsay Troy, her kind of signature dirt tone is an OC2 into a Big Muff. And just that sound, something does it for me. I mean, it's just like, that is perfection. So I am building a pedal that is essentially that. It is, you know, what I would say is Lindsay Troy's tone. Um, just sub-octave into a Big Muff. I've made quite a few modifications on the Big Muff side of things to make it more than just three knobs, but uh, coming very soon. In fact, I've got the uh, the prototype boards sitting at my feet right now as we speak. Amazing. That's yeah. for, I think, uh, for someone like me who needs a reason to try a Big Muff, uh, you know, beyond the Big Muffness of it, uh, that sounds very exciting. Uh, and so, uh, kind of, I'm... I think, uh, you know, our, our friend Alec would know, um, you know, much more about this, but that at least to my ears of my little knowledge of, uh, the white stripes that kind of reminds me of what kind of flicked the switch for me. Understanding the big muff is doing, there's no, it, here's the only guitar in the mix and, you know, kind of covering the f fullest frequency spectrum, uh, you know, on each end and then letting those mids just, you know, kind of do whatever they want. Exactly. Exactly. And I mean, I think every one of us has a different artist that we, we associate with that. And I think Jack White's a, a perfect one. You know, a lot of his signature tone is Big Muff and it's very distinct how he plays and his style and his attack, I think lends very well. And, and the Big Muff is a circuit that it takes octave either up or down or all around very well. Yeah, um, absolutely. So I, I think, you know, people that play it like that, I think, t tend to really make it shine. Yeah. Uh, so here we, uh, we started talking about, uh, you know, affordable <laughs> pedals, and we ended up with the Big Muff is its own genre of pedal. I like it. <laughs> its own category. So, yeah, that's great. That's a great uh, um, scoop. I don't know if uh, that's... Are you near the end of design moving towards, um, you know, production? Or are you so, still in prototype phase? I am this... We're still pretty much in the prototype phase with it. Um, the Big Muff part of the circuit I have played with before... And I've got that part of it pretty well dialed in where I would want it. It's the adding the sub octave to it that uh, is the new part. So that's the part we have, like what I've got sitting on the floor right here is the first time I've I've mixed those two things together. But I won't spill all the beans yet, but that's not all that's going to go on with this pedal. So Oh, amazing. Well dot, dot, dot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to see, uh, uh, you know, what else you do with that and to hear the combination of everything. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. When is. when we stop recording, I'll I'll fill you in a little bit. Oh, but. awesome. Uh, and I I won't post it to Reddit. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think um, uh, just kind of tying everything uh, back together. I think hearing you talk about you have the more affordable series and then you have your pedals that you can go above and beyond with. Uh, and you know, the balance is where it all kind of works, um, you know, for not losing all of your money <laughs> while doing this. Um, right. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's interesting to see, um, I haven't played any of the 1970 series pedals, but I have played the, an O and a tone station, um, which is connected to the preamp and, you know, hearing, oh, this is, you know, what a really, um, you know, simple but well done approach to this can do. And it's the kind of thing of, if this is what you need, if this type of effect is what you need, then that, you know, there's no reason to, to, um, you know, move anywhere else but this because it, just does it to then you know seeing things like uh the niagara and you know um the modded uh dragon versions of oh the, yeah uh, yeah um the piccolo uh falsetto and then um yeah excited to see this and uh you know see all the ways that you uh you know kind of mess with it and you know see what comes of that Thank you. So, um, with that, uh, I think we've kind of uh, covered the gamut of um, affordable boutique pedals. Do you have anything else um, that you'd like to say about, you know, the kind of topic or or not about Big Muffs? Uh, anything? <laughs> <laughs> no, I would just, uh, you know, I would again encourage folks to explore who they're buying from and what they're buying. There are a lot of folks, um, you know, Ian and I, we, we kind of hinted at it earlier, but we, we are on a discord group with a number of small builders. I'd say, I feel like there's probably close to 150, maybe even 200 folks that are part of the group, but I'd say there's probably 40 or 50 that are regularly active on there. Um, there's some new folks making some really, really, really cool stuff right now. And, I mean, I hate to say it, but new folks usually means cheaper stuff because they don't have the the brand to hide behind to to charge bigger prices for stuff. So um, you might get into a, a fairly fresh boutique builder and and find a pedal that's sub one hundred. That's you know one of the best things you've ever played. Um, Absolutely. So it, and, and and it's not you know you're not paying for you know the the CEO of Roland's. <laughs> kids to go to private school i mean you're you're you know this is money that's going to a, a small builder his family their family um and uh you know staying in the community here so uh, again you know be, be willing to explore outside the brands that you you know and love and and take a chance on something you might find something that you really really enjoy at a builder that you've never heard of perfect what a great way to wrap things up I absolutely agree with that. I, um, not to go on a final tangent, but I got my, uh, BA Ferguson guitar for what I would consider to be a steal, but that's just how he prices them because he's not the largest boutique, uh, luthier out there. And so, you know, that's what he can sell his guitars for. Um, and so, you know, and, always and finding I'll, new people is, a, you know, a great way to kind of both hear new things and try new, you know, types of gear, but also, you know, potentially get uh, a great deal or something like that. If if you'll indulge me one, one more tangent, I'll, I'll go down the same path. So, um about a year ago, I started following an account on Instagram, Deadbug Circuits. Um, got to know Zach pretty well. We're both from Toledo. He still lives up there. I'm down in Columbus now. So we kind of built a, you know, built a friendship on that. And um, he was a, a newer builder, but he's doing just absolutely crazy stuff. And uh, he introduced a pedal called the Babel about eight months ago. And I have number one. 
and it is just a, again i would have never bought this pedal it doesn't it, it's not anything that's even in a world that i live in musically um because it's four different drone circuits that you can mix together and then mix your guitar signal into it and it's got like a an effects loop that you can run stuff through and then you can run it in an effect i mean it's just it's bananas and it is so much fun to play with. I mean, it, it, like when we are having a bad day at the shop, we break <laughs> out the babble and half a dozen other pedals and just make the weirdest noises and, you know, piss off the neighbors. But <laughs> I mean, again, it's, it's something that, you know, I found on Instagram and I took a chance and it's amazing. And, and that's do that. People do that. <laughs> We should all do that a little bit more often. So, yeah, that's great. So uh, we're going to end the, uh, um, the main episode here. And okay. so uh, then if you're listening to this on Patreon in two weeks, you'll get uh, the bonus episode uh, in the same place. If you're listening to this on YouTube, the bonus episode is on my patreon right now and you can check that out but uh otherwise that's it for the episode um john do you you know want to tell people where they can find you online sure so uh my website is rare buzzer uh that's rare buzz with an er at the end dot com um i am at rare buzzer on all social media platforms um including tiktok but i think i've posted one thing on there <laughs> Uh, Grant Wilson talked me into that. <laughs> I'm like, I'm too old for this, Grant. And he's like, well, you got to get it. At least save the name. So that's that's exactly what I did. But um, but yeah, at Rare Buzzer everywhere. Um, 1970 series. I think we're going to do a more formal drop toward the end of October. But if you kind of either pay attention to my Instagram, I try to keep people updated as to what's available. Or just hit the website. I mean, if it's on the website, you can buy it right now. And uh, um they're kind of coming and going. I've got like, I'll have some stuff in stock. I'll have other stuff in stock. But I think again, late October, I'm going to be lined up to, you know, do a more formal launch and hopefully include the fuzz in that. Like I said, I think we're desperately close to it. Uh, just doing some final testing. So Awesome. Well, I will certainly myself be keeping an eye out for the fuzz. So yeah. Thanks so much for, uh, for joining us. Um, for, or joining me <laughs> it's it's just me thanks so much for joining oh, me course. for the for the podcast uh really appreciate it um, absolutely happy to be here and thank you everyone for listening to us uh and we will uh you know have more of the podcast for you soon thanks mm -hmm.